So, we will continue talking about uh, verbs and objects. We are looking at verbs and objects in the process of understanding structure of sentences or a structure of a sentence. Out of different components of a sentence, we have seen both the parts namely subject and predicate. We have seen components of a predicate namely verbs and objects and then we have seen the relationship between subject and predicate to be precise subjects and verbs. Okay? And then we started looking at what is the relationship between subject, between verbs and their objects. We will look at more in terms of structural representation and con, uh, structural, repre, uh, structural representation of a sentence little later. Okay. So, uh, last time we were talking about nature of verb in terms of transitive and intransitive and we saw that transitivity is largely responsible for how or why a verb will have an object or will not have an will not have an object right so, and what was the what did we conclude uh, if a verb is a transitive one then it has an object if it is an intransitive one then it doesn't have an object right and uh, sometimes there are few verbs in languages, they are ditransitive verbs which will have two objects. Okay? Now, please pay attention to these number of, number of objects and, and the fact that they are associated with verbs in, in the sense that transitivity or intransitivity may be nature of a verb okay? and once a verb is transitive or intransitive that is going to stay forever in the sense that transitivity of a verb is not dependent on languages. A verb may, may not be transitive in one and intransitive in the other language. If a verb is transitive in language A, it is going to be transitive everywhere. Okay? Uh, now, we are going to see uh, how, why is this, why is this valency required? Why is this association between object and verbs required? And also that the relationship the, the presence of object is dependent on verb, not, not on anything else. So, it seems like subject and object, okay. the, what, what, what's, the, what's the primary difference between a subject and an object besides, besides their position in a sentence. So, now, now you know about the position of these things in a sentence. What do you think will be a primary difference between a subject and an object? Anybody? Sorry? No dependence on Subjects have no dependence on verbs. verbs. That is, every sentence will have a verb and every sentence will have a subject. These are two independent principles. They are not dependent on one another. However, whether a verb is going to be present in a sentence, whether an object is going to be present in a sentence or not is going to be dependent on the nature of the verb, right? That is the primary difference between an object and the verb. We have seen the intransitive, transitive and ditransitive nature of, of verbs and then I have, I tried to demonstrate some of them through examples 
to you that verbs like sleep, go, come, sit, dance happen to be intransitive verbs as they do not have objects. Okay? And uh, verbs like eat, read and write are transitive ones as they require an object. Okay? And we know that we know the distinction between requirement and not requirement by putting a diagnostic test. What was the test? You, you just need to question the verb with what? If the question is a legitimate question, do you understand by legitimate question? That is, if the question sounds okay, then you are going to get an answer also. And that answer is most likely the object of the verb. In other words, the answer determines whether the verb will have an object or not. Okay? Now, uh, uh, how, how do we argue that the noun home in sentence number 2 is not an object of this verb? Besides, besides knowing the diagnostic test of what, right? When we, when we question this verb with what, we know that that is not a good question. Go what, right? Therefore, this will not have, not have an object. This, does, this verb does not seem to allow an object, right? Nonetheless, you see something here, right? And sentence sounds okay. If someone says, I was going, right? I was going. You would, you would want to know where. You, you understand what I am saying? When someone says, I was going, does not sound like a complete sentence, right? At the same time, this does not seem to be an object of the verb. So, what is going on here is an important, important question for us to understand. I am only underlining this question for you to think about it and then, uh, then, uh, then, then we will we'll discuss this question little later. If you look at the second sentence, Chris was sitting in a chair. If we simply say Chris was sitting, it is not as, as bad, but sounds little bit incomplete and sitting in a chair, in a room, uh, in a class gives completion to a sentence, right? So, we will we'll talk about them too. Remember, I have told you that uh, there are some, verb, some verbs which may pass these kinds of diagnostic tests, but it still may not be a transitive verb. Or, or the other way around. Do you, do you remember this, this point? What I was, what I am trying to say is this diagnostic test may not be completely foolproof. Nonetheless, it works to a great extent. All right? Okay. Now, uh, I want to, sh so in a way I want to put all these discussions in, a, in perspective in an example and see how they work and then carry forward our discussions to a, to a different level. Okay? So, if we have a sentence like this, John likes to eat pizza with his friends in ED. Sounds like a good sentence? This is a good sentence? Now, for, for our understanding, I have tried to categorize this sentence in different uh, categories that we have been discussing so far. Right? The subject of the sentence is? Subject of the sentence is? John. Everything else likes to eat pizza with his friends in the evening is going to be predicate. The verb of this sentence is like. Okay? The verb of this sentence is like. Do you agree with this? Or do you think there is something else? Hmm? 
Just like, okay, first of all, let me hear from you and then we talk about this. How many verbs do you see in this sentence? Two. But if, I, if, if you are asked, what is the verb of this sentence? What will be the answer? These are not two complicated questions, right? The fact that there are two verbs and I can see that, anyone can see that and still someone asks you the question, what is the verb of this sentence? What will be your answer? Knowing, knowing that the answer cannot be both of them. Why? Why like? And, and uh, like, like any scientific investigation, every answer must be supported with evidence, right? The answer cannot be, I think so. That is not an answer in any science, any, any scientific investigation. I am sure you know, this, you know that, right? I, I think so or I believe or I feel are not the answers. So, to, to make things more precise and, and these are not too complicated, it just requires little bit of attention. We know that every sentence must have a verb, right? This sentence has one and maybe it has more than one. But when we say every sentence must have a verb, it must have a meaning. That is the proposition must have a meaning. So, and, and if you are deciding that the verb is like or I am telling you the verb is like, there must be a reason for that. What, what do you think is the reason? Should not be too complicated. When a question like what does John like is asked, then John likes to eat pizza, so like is he? No, not, not really the answer that I am looking for. Not really the answer that I am looking for. Uh, you are saying that somehow we can ask a question where we can involve the subject and then probably get some, some answer. It is simpler than that. Sorry, it is simpler than that. Go ahead. Anybody else? We can say the same thing in different words. That is the verb which agrees, which carries agreement features. Remember, we have talked about agreement at great length, right? That is the verb which carries agreement features. John happens to be the subject because it agrees with John, right? If you, if you change the subject, if you just make the subject plural, you are going to see some changes on the verb, right? Suppose if I have to say John and Mary, then what will be this, what will be, how will the verb change? John and Mary like to eat pizza with their friends in the evening, right? Now, nothing is happening to the verb to eat. Therefore, that is not the, that is not the verb of the sentence participating in agreement. Therefore, like is the verb as it happens to participate in the, in the agreement. It is, it is making sense to everybody? Do you, do you see that? It is not too complicated. It just requires little bit of attention and I am asking you this question only because you have seen agreement features before and you know that there is going to be just one verb in a sentence. When we say there is going to be just one verb in a sentence, what we mean is only one verb will be participating in the agreement. In the absence of such an agreement, no matter how many verbs you have in a sentence, the sentence is not complete. As long as that agreement is taken care of, the sentence is complete, over, done. Sir, so, look at it step by step. So, should we first identify the subject or should we first identify the verb in a sentence? Because when we defined subject, we said that it is that which agrees with the verb. Mm -hmm. So, the definition itself says that first identify the verb and then you will be able to identify the subject. Not really. The, that, the requirement says first you have to identify whether the sentence 
is fulfilling the requirement of agreement or not. Your question is also important for learning language, right? for uh, acquisition of language. How do we learn a language? Do we, do we learn to identify categories first? Either in terms of lexical categories like John, Mary, eat, drink, pizza, do we learn things this way? Or do we, do we, do we learn grammatical categories, that is grammatical relations like subjects, verbs, objects? Or how? What else? I mean, one convenient answer or depending upon a particular level of discussion, we can say, one can say, that is not, that's not very important at this time. One can also say, we do not know much about them. But you can always investigate how does it work. Okay? Therefore, when, when we try to understand a sentence, which let us say we call S, right, and say, it has two parts, which has, let us say, roughly to begin with, I am going to say subject and predicate, right? Subject and predicate. Or we can say, we can refine this and say, subjects are usually a noun phrase, okay? We can say a noun phrase and a verb phrase meaning everything else is still part of a verb phrase which is predicate, right? To, to resolve questions like that, when people started looking at feature of a sentence, they had to look at things what were called functional properties of sentence or functional features, uh, the, the abstract things that we do not see. And then when, when we determine that neither subject nor verb is really a requ required, really, really defines a sentence, then people started defining this thing in terms of what was called agreement. So, we really, to, your, your answer was very simple, but with that, I am sorry, your question was very simple, but with your question I wanted to emphasize, I do want to emphasize significance of agreement, that in a sentence, it is not really important to identify a subject or a verb. What is important to identify? The agreement. And once you see the agreement, then you can see which are the components that are participating in the agreement. Thus you understand what is the subject and what is the verb. And lot of times, once we identify a subject, lot of times that subject is going to be a logical subject, also grammatical subject. At times, depending upon which language we are talking about, they may, there may be some differences. That is, in some cases, logical subjects may be a different one and a grammatical subject may be a different one. Nonetheless, what is, what is more striking is all, all that you know are not going to be in contradiction with one another. They do not violate any principle. Okay? And then, uh, so we will expand this thing further later. Okay? So let me, let me move on and show you more things. So, next in this sentence, what is the object of this sentence? We see so many, so many things after the after verb or associated with the verb. And I am telling you that the object is pizza, right? Because it answers the question, what? If we say, eat what? Right? Then we get the answer, pizza. We do not get the answer, friends or evening or anything else, right? But I also want to draw your attention that the rest of the sentence, rest of the things in the sentence is not finding any space here. What are they? When we say with his friends, what is that? And in the evening, what is that? Do you, do you see my question? Do you understand my 
under, uh, understand my question? We have been talking about a sentence, we have talked about agreement, we have talked about subjects, we have talked about verbs, and we have now finished talking about objects. But we see there are several other things in the sentence. So, what can we quickly say without saying much about rest of the things? One, one, one way to put this is, see, what we have been talking about are really required elements of a sentence. Okay? They are grammatical relations and they are required elements of a sentence. Having said that, we end up saying that rest of the, rest of the things are not required elements. Right? And that, that happens to be true that rest of the things give you additional information but are not really required components for making the sentence. Therefore, and, and we, I, I, I do not want to go and repeat everything, you know the required element is an agreement. Then the required thing, manifestation of agreement is between these two. And then we know which one is a verb, which one is the subject. Okay? And if at all, this needs an object or not. That is all. And then we have a sentence. Everything else in the sentence is simply giving us more information. Not really, but and, and uh, when I say not really required er, and just giving us information, I do not mean they are not semantically relevant. Okay? I am not saying that we do not need to say those things. I am only saying required with respect, required or not required, with respect to requirements of component in a sentence for the, for the formation of a sentence and at the level of I language, where whether a sentence is good or not, here is all that we are talking about. Whether someone in a conversation needs to give this information that they were eating pizza with friends or enemies or whoever is not really required information at the, uh, at the level of I language that is representation of a sentence here. Getting, getting the point? So, it is important to understand what we mean by required elements. Required elements simply means required components in formation of a sentence without which sentence may not be complete. Okay? You, you can drop everything else in the sentence, but if we drop pizza, if we say John likes to eat with his friends in the evening, right? There is some, the sentence gives you and if you test the grammaticality of this sentence with native speakers, this tells you that there is something missing in this sentence. Okay? And if it does not sound too odd to us, that is because our languages allows, our languages allow dropping of objects. Because the moment we say, John likes to eat with his friends, right? We are cons the, the the idea is in our the idea in our languages is the the slot of the object is still there. It's just conceptually not required. When we say John likes to eat pizza, okay, what's the object of the sentence? The 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 verb is like, right? The object is not just pizza. Eating pizza, the whole thing is the object. That, that's what I meant by damage control. And I said, like I said, I should have picked up a, 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 a simpler sentence than that. We can say, John eats a pizza. Okay? John eats a pizza. In that sentence, what's the verb? Eat. And the object is pizza. Here, the, the, the verb is like, so the object is going to be what is it that John likes and what is it that John likes? Eating pizza. Therefore, to eat pizza is the object of the verb like. This clarification good enough? Do you, do you see this, this thing? Okay. So, when I said 
in our languages, ob dropping of an object is okay. And therefore, these kinds of sentences in English where we drop an object and sounds okay to us. The reason is, if I say John eats pizza with his friends, right? We can say John eats with his friends. The moment we say John eats with, with his friend, we are conceptually allowing this possibility that the fact that we are already saying eating must be eating something, right? Must be eating something. And if that something is understood, so if it does not manifest overtly, still at a conceptual level, the slot of object stage, but not necessarily we need to articulate that. In a language like English, that is not allowed. We must have objects articulated. Therefore, the dropping of an object is not allowed in a language like English. Is this, is this, this clear to you? Why? I am I'm I'm talking about several things together. One, why English does not allow to drop subjects, I am sorry, drop objects. Why our languages, that is Hindi, Ingl Hindi, Tamil, Telugu, Malayalam and many others, why our languages allow to drop a subject? And then why when we speak English, a sentence in English without an object looks okay to us? Okay? All right. Sir? Yeah. Why it allows or it does not allow, it is language dependent. We have not answered why it allows or why it does not allow. Uh, why it allows and why it does not allow meaning dropping of an object? Why does a language allow, why does not a language allow? That is true. It, see, objects are required by verbs. That is a principle. Why? Not, not why. Some languages may allow to drop an object and some, and some languages may not is, is what is language dependent. Okay. Now, then the question was? But why some languages allow and why? We have not answered the why part of it. That, that, that is what I was trying, I, I was trying to say. Uh, I, I, the, and this answer may not be a complete answer. In some languages like ours, when it is, it has a space that is conceptual space to, to fulfill it, fulfill the object in its absence. Such as when we say eat, the object is going to be something edible, right? Therefore, it is, it it's allowed in the sense that it's okay not to have the subject. Now, let me let me give you some bizarre kind of examples. So, when when we say uh, John likes to play, what we are saying is the requirement of language English is we must say John likes to play football. Right? For our English, that let us say Indian English, it is okay to say John likes to play. Because in our languages, it is okay to say the counterpart of that sentence. The reason why it is allowed, the, the verb, transitive verb allowed without a subject, we, need, we are making a distinction that that is not allowed at the conceptual level, the, uh, the slot of the object is there. But in reality, we drop it because of the following reason. That when we say John likes, John, John plays cricket, it, the sentence possibly could not be John likes, John, John plays pizza. You see, the, you, see, you see the restriction on the sentence. This is called selectional restriction. Okay? This, there is something in language that operates as a principle, it is called selectional restriction, which is a particular kind of verb is going to select only particular kinds of objects. What we have seen so far is whether a verb selects an object or not. Okay? In some cases verbs do not, in some cases verbs do. What we have not seen is what are the types of objects a verb is allowed to select. Like I am giving you example, eat cricket cannot be an allowed 
sequence even though it is fulfilling the grammatical requirement. What is the grammatical requirement? It is a transitive verb and it must have an object. Is, is, are people with me? Do you understand? No, 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 hold on, hold on. I am coming to that in a moment. I am coming to that in a moment. No, I, I, I am coming to that also. Hold on. Let me, let me first finish. And I know that you, you get the point, but I need to make it with clarity. Certain kinds of verbs require only certain kinds of argument, that is only certain kinds of object. When we say eat, it, the verb, the, the sequence eat cricket is not allowed because it is not fulfilling the requirement of the type of object it needs to select. And this requirement is called selectional restriction. Okay, this, this is clear and you are right. The selectional requirement is a semantic criteria. Absolutely right, no denying from that fact. Selectional restriction is a semantic criteria. Now, remember few days ago, I was telling you about independence of syntax. Do you, do you remember about independence of syntax? Colorless green ideas sleep furiously, where we discussed that a sentence can be grammatical independence, independent of its semantics. That is, even though a sentence does not have a meaning, it can be grammatical. Now, I am telling you, bringing you, bringing something in, which says selectional restriction is an important factor. Now, what I am trying to say is, I am giving you two, two perspectives and two, two positions and both are at work in language. The, the discussion on selectional restriction becomes the logical argument refuting independence of syntax. Those who say independence of syntax exists can be refuted through selectional restriction. Not, not completely, but to a great extent. Okay? However, dropping selectional restriction allows independence of syntax. So, though there is no contradiction, they are in opposition with one another to some extent. Because selectional restriction does not allow, does not, is, is not, a, not a principle only at the level of Word, only at the level of verb and its object. Selectional restriction works at many levels. For example, when we talk about adjectives and noun, selection between adjectives and noun. So, we can say the moment we have a, uh, we have a, a noun, let us say, uh, uh, pointer or a computer, it can select only certain kinds of adjectives. We cannot say, uh, we can say black computer, but we cannot say sweet computer. Okay? Um, um, I, I, I hope you get the, get, get the point. We can, uh, similarly, we can say sweet tea. We can, we can also say black tea, but we cannot say uh, fast, tea. fast tea. Well, we cannot say that also. If it is coming from a fast food joint, we can say that. But we, you get the point. You, you just have to pick something which is not allowed, right? Uh, mm. Sorry? Bright tea. Bright tea. Yeah, I mean, the, as long as we get the point, we, we, we are good with that, right? So, you get the, get, the, get the answer of selectional restriction, independence of syntax, and why two things are given as examples and counter examples to one another. All right? Now, coming back to your thing. Sir, there is a question. Give the example, John likes to play cricket. Right. Sir, but here we do not need cricket because likes is, uh, likes require a object, then it, it can be simply to play. Yeah, that that is true. John, that that is true. So, here also you are fine. When you, when you say, John likes what? To eat. But if we have pizza in the sentence, then what we are saying is the whole chunk is the object. The, if, if pizza was not there, then the sentence was okay. 
right i like i like i told you i should have picked up a simpler sentence than that because we are not ready for the whole discussion uh, right away by by when i say we are not ready we, we, i mean we need to i need to take you through several other things to reach here so right now what i am saying is pizza is not important here but there is a reason why it is important because when we say john likes to eat okay to eat is also going to play to eat is a is a small sentence within its own right and this is where we are not ready to discuss that part to eat is a small sentence within its own right it, these are miraculous and magical things in languages and i i, I don't mean to uh, digress from the point but i cannot leave it hanging either so give me 2 minutes and then i come back to this dear i'm sure all of us know the sentences like i want to go right simple sentence how many sentences do you see here on the board i want to go right it's it looks like there is one sentence but if i tell you this has two sentences in it do you, can do you do you believe that yes so what are the two sentences in this i want to i want to and to go no you are saying there are two verbs where are the two sentences i i think at this level you can discuss this much right you are saying there are two verbs and probably you are right about two sentences but we need to say more to make them two sentences okay we are saying the first sentence is not i want is want a transitive verb transitive verb or not a transitive verb it's a transitive verb because when we say i want i want something want what so just saying i want is not a complete sentence what is complete sentence is i want to go okay within that whole thing so this is sentence number 1 what's the object of this verb want to go right now this is argued to be an independent sentence by itself what's the object of this verb is not really a verb because verbs do not become an object okay and 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 i'll i'll discuss little bit more on these things later i promise you this thing i just not right now i just want to show you that this is a sentence it's not simply a verb it's not a noun this is a sentence by itself because the subject of this sentence uh you know this is when i say sentence i am i am i am cutting several things out of this discussion it's not a complete sentence but it's a sentence and i promise you i'll bring you back to this this these kinds of questions and these kinds of questions are important in language because this they tell a lot <coughs> they they give us a lot of theoretically motivated insights in insights and they they help us understand language in a much better way the other reason why these things are important is they are such so simple sentences but they could be so complicated at the level of human cognition i am saying both and i i i uh, i'm saying that knowing very well that we will wait for more discussions on this thing i am saying this is a sentence but not a full sentence so far this is not a sentence because do you see a subject here no if if i tell you there is a subject here therefore this is a sentence because when i say i want to go i am basically saying i want i to go because the possibilities are how do i say i want can can i say or not i want him to go 
I want you to go. Can I say these sentences or not? Right? These are good sentences. They are exactly the same pattern. I want you to go, I want him to go, I want her to go. Right? This, so, when I say I want to go, the sentence is I want I to go. Right? The identity of these two, the moment it is matched, okay? when I say I want to go, the identity of this thing and this thing is matched. The principle of economy applies and it is deleted, not needed. Cannot be deleted when I say I want him to go, because the sentence is completely different. I want him to go. The, the sentence is completely different. The identity between I and him is not matched. It is about a different, different person. Therefore, that stays and this one is deleted. Which means, which, which is to say that this slot of the subject is open. Okay? Now, we, so we can say that there is a subject and there is a verb. But where is the agreement? Okay? There is no agreement between subject and the verb. So, I will come to the agreement part later. And this is what I said, I will discuss this thing later. Right now, I can tell you this seems to be a subject sentence, but not a good, not a real sentence. By real sentence, I mean this sentence will not have an independent status outside this big sentence. However, in this big sentence, this has any status. Okay. Similarly, John likes to eat pizza. To eat pizza has a different status. Okay. It is not a complete sentence by itself, but some have argued that to eat the pizza, to eat pizza is the object of the main verb, want. But pizza is the object of to eat, even though it is not a complete sentence. And then there are more discussions required for that. Therefore, that is needed. But right now, I can simply say, pizza is not the object in our discussion right now. What is our discussion? What is it? In our discussion, the subject, the object is to eat pizza. Likes what? To eat. Even though I, I feel like I should have picked up a simpler sentence, but I am glad that we, I picked up that sentence, so that we got to discuss something else. I hope things are clear to you. you. You can see these are simple sentences and not very difficult to, for us to see. We say these kinds of sentences all, several times every day. Right? All right. Uh, uh, th this sentence is relevant for discussing couple of other modules of theory, couple of other principles of language, which I am coming to very soon. Now, uh, we will stop in a couple of minutes. But I want you to see that we are we are heading in a we are heading towards the discussing these things. Okay? Where the, the point is, and even with the in the previous thing, when we were looking at subject, predicate, objects, and verb, the point is identifying things. Okay? In this slide, I am only trying to show you grammatical relations. Okay? Now, and you see that some elements are required and some elements are not required. This is why I have listed with his friends and in the evening are uh, something else that we will discuss. We, I have a sentence like, students of physics, students of physics, this, this is not a good sentence. You see that? What will be the word? Students of physics like to eat pizza. with their friends in the evening. Actually, I think what I wanted to write is student of physics. Okay? So, that, that, that's a typo nonetheless. What is the subject of this sentence? Student of physics. Student of physics. Right? Right? Now, before discussing anything else, what can you say about the subject? Of physics is quite redundant. No. That's not redundant. That's not redundant. Redundant is it's not redundant in the sense that 
Okay, let me first say why do you think it is redundant? So that is fine. So, what you are saying is students could be of anything, but someone who wants to specify students, right, for that processing it is not redundant. You see the difference between redundant and not redundant, we are saying the reason why it sounds redundant to you is because you are used to seeing subjects as one, one little noun, right, John, Mary, students. Here we are seeing for the first time or at least we are looking at it for the first time that the subject is a bigger chunk. I will also show you in wh under what circumstances this could be redundant and uh, under what circumstances these are not redundant such as in this case it is not redundant. We want to specify students of what? When we say students, students of what? Right? It is not redundant number one. So all we are, I am trying to show you through this sentence is a sentence could be bigger chunk, I am sorry, a subject could be a bigger chunk okay? and the rest of the things you have already seen. So through this we are, see, we are, we are looking at the following point that several, several words in a sentence seem to form a group okay? and group of words are called constituents. Okay? They, that, is sim, that is simply to, simply to say they are forming one cluster and that is easy to see. Like you have seen the student of physics, in this sentence the fat monkey was jumping on the roof of this building. Right? When we say monkey, monkey what is the subject? What is the subject of this sentence? The fat monkey was jumping on the roof of this building the fat monkey. The, uh, so, in a way this, the subject is monkey, but the fat and monkey, they together seem to form a group. right? Why is the forming a group with monkey right? and not watch? Right? So, watch jumping on the roof of this building is one constituent and even in that bigger chunk, on the roof of this building is another looks like another constituent and then when you, when you see on the roof and then of this building these are a smaller chunks right on the roof of this building is one chunk and within that of this building is another another chunk the all all i am trying to show you is these are these are we, we see in sentences that words form groups and how they form groups and what is the, what's the notion of the whole constituent heads and then, then eventually we, with, through these groups we are trying to go to phrases and constitution of a phrase is that how do we, how do we recognize a phrase is what we are looking at. So, we will we'll talk about phrases and their constitutions soon so that we can come to different principles uh, uh, and discussing sentences like these. Okay? We stop here.